brother and sister Taylor in a little bit, and so um, I'm going to tell her, just to open her heart. And just like I did in that dream, I chased her and said, um, Sister Cheryl, teach us. We don't know. We, we don't know what we're doing sometimes. Just, just teach us. So. Praise the Lord. Um, well, when Pastor asked me to talk, um, he, he's been mentioning this is coming, this is coming for the last few months, and, and you would think that I'd be really prepared, and uh, I'm not. I'm not, you know, because I live this. What do I need to prepare? I just, you know, I live this every day. I live autism. I live... Um, the chaos of autism every single day. And I think when I go to sleep, I sleep autism because my mind doesn't stop. You know, it's constant, 24 seven. I wake up and it's there. Excuse me. Yesterday was a really, really bad day. It was a hard day. And um, the day before was a really, really good day, you know? So we have this constant up and down with autism in my household, in my life. Uh, the only thing that keeps me sane is God. <laughs> he is my strength and my peace. I do have peace in the chaos, if that's even possible. But with God, all things are possible. So I have that, and I just thank him for that, because without that, without Jesus, I would have committed suicide. I would have been, I would have probably taken my children's life, because there was one time that I, the, it was so dark. This lifestyle of autism was so dark in my life, and I was, and I was serving God. But it was so dark that I felt like I was literally in a pit, I was in a hole in the ground, and here I am going to church and smiling, a smile on the outside, but it was so dark on the inside, and I was in this pit that nobody knew I was in, but God, and the thoughts, how the enemy comes against you, the thoughts would come into my mind, take your children, put them in the car, and drive into the lake. I heard that over and over. I would drive in back and forth to Nebraska to Children's Hospital, taking Abraham to his many visits that we would go to. And I wanted to drive off that bridge. I wanted to drive off the Missouri Bridge. I didn't physically want to. My mind wanted to. My emotions wanted to. I just wanted to be done. And that was the enemy, you know, because he knew where would we be? <laughs> you know, my soul, my kids, you know, the torment and, the, and what would that cause everybody that was left behind? You know, what kind of God allows that to happen, people would say. But the enemy is real, and he used that against me. And every time I heard, kill your children, take your, take, take, just take your guys' lives and be done with this, and you'd have so much peace. It'd be over. Um, I'd hit my knees. It took a while. Sometimes it was really, really hard, but I just knew I had to, I had to get to the throne I need to reach out for help. I called my sister-in-law. She was my, my help. I was married. I've been married uh, 15 years. And at the time, I was a still a single parent because autism was too hard for him to handle. He worked, and he worked many long, long hours at Tyson. And so I was a single parent living in a marriage, you know, that was, I was, I was the one, you know, it's really hard when you, you're the one who has to take care of the kids all the time. You got the one that has to deal with all the meltdowns and all the, you know, it's just really difficult. So, you know, 
you have to have that one person. You need to have somebody, like the girls were saying, support. If, if, if you could build a relationship with someone in church that you know that's struggling, you know, we all see Sister Amanda, right? That breaks my heart, and I haven't reached out to her. God's been talking to me about that. I need to reach out to that girl. She's my sister. And who better knows the struggle of children with disabilities? Cheryl, come on, you know. We see her. She, she loves her children. She's a good mommy. She just needs a break. I needed a break. So talking about autism, I'm going to... You know, i kind of been all over the place, but um, I'm going to start from the beginning of when autism came into my life. Um, I, was, I was going on uh, my third biological child. I was pregnant um, with Abraham, and Abraham was born uh, six weeks early. I had gestational diabetes, and my water had broken, and um, we went to the hospital right away, and it was a fairly easy um, labor, six hours of labor, and, and he was in the world. He was here. And um, they took him right the second that he was delivered. They took him from me, and they said, he's not breathing, um, and we need to work on him. So I, I could see them working on him, and they said, uh, we need to get the ambulance here. You need to sign these papers. And it was within five minutes. They had him ready and incubated, and they were taking him to Sioux City, to Children's Hospital, because he wasn't breathing. And they would get him to breathe, and then he'd stop. And so they, were, they said he had sleep apnea, but he just wasn't breathing. So they took him away from me. Um, within 10 minutes after giving birth. And um, I didn't know if I was ever going to see him again. I mean, I, alive. And that was a really scary, scary time in my life because he was prayed for. He was wanted. He, he, you know, this was my children. I never conceived easily. And it was 10 years between my oldest son and my youngers. And so they were just so wanted, Jenna and Abraham. He was in the he was in the NICU um, for 14 days. It was unheard of. He was he was a big baby. He had he had high blood sugars. I was gestational diabetic, so he had um, he had really high sugar levels. Um, he also was very very jaundiced, and so they they worked on him and they had monitors and and for two weeks he was there, and they finally released him, and he was a six pound baby, you know, and, and pretty healthy. And we thought, wow, you know, praise God, you know, we got through that little hump and we're done and over with. And we took him home and for the first two years, it was a good, you know, we had, we had, we had a toddler, you know, a baby and then a toddler and he was normal. What's normal? Like they said, what is normal? There was, there were signs in the beginning of, um, when he started to um, play, he didn't play like a normal child. He didn't play with his toys like a normal kid would play with toys. He didn't even care about the toys. He liked things. He liked spoons, and he liked just weird atom inanimate objects. You know, he just, and he'd line them up. He'd make lines. He had lines all over the house. And we would sit back and we're like, what is he doing? Oh my goodness, look, he's got like a fork and a spoon and a cup and a, you know, okay, maybe a toy and there's something else and there's these long lines that look almost like train tracks. And we just thought, wow, he's really smart. What is he doing? You know, and he, he, I've never seen that before. Well, it went from making lines and doing very ritualistic things. Um, one day, he, he just turned two and a half, I think, and he was not paying attention to us. You know, I had noticed, because here I'm the single mom staying at home, and I noticed that when I'd say, Abraham, Abraham, he wouldn't look at me. He stopped looking at me. He stopped reacting to my voice. And I was like, that is weird. 
And I'm like, Abraham, Abraham. And I'd call him louder and almost to screaming at him. And, and he wouldn't react. And I'd smack my hands together and he wouldn't react. He wouldn't jump. And I thought, oh my God, my child is going deaf. So I was like, there's something wrong, you know. And I told my husband, and my husband's like, there's nothing wrong with him. It's all in your head, you know, because he didn't see this. He didn't see all the stuff that I was seeing. And one day, so I kind of was like, okay, I'm just being a mom, you know. I'm just overreacting. I've just been with the kids too long. And so we let it go for about two months. And at that point, it just continually got worse. If that it could have got worse, it did. He, um, he stopped looking at us. Not only is he not listening to us, but he literally stopped looking at us. You know, if you know anything about babies, and all of us have had babies pretty much, when you have a baby and you're holding it and someone walks into the room, that baby's eyes are big and they look at you and they watch you like, what are you doing? Are you going to touch me? Are you going to grab me? Are you going to pick me up? Are you going to kiss me? You know, Abraham wouldn't do that. He, he, he just... He'd look at the ground. He'd zone off, almost like, you know, like a, a silent seizure. He just was not there. There was something not in his eyes. It was an emptiness. And so I couldn't get his attention, and I couldn't no longer get him to look at me. And I was starting to freak out, like, okay, I need to call the doctor. Like, something's wrong. And I t told my husband again. My husband says, there's nothing wrong. It's all in your head. You know, you're just being a mom, and uh, I really struggled because my husband worked so much that I wanted his approval. I loved him. You know, he was the, the man of the household. He was the one who was taking care of us, and, and I didn't want to go and be like, you know, go behind his back, and I'm taking him to the doctors anyways, and I just didn't do that, so, so I went ahead and um, I just let it go. And just about, like I said, around that two and a half year mark, after some more signs, I noticed that he jumped up. Abraham, we were in the living room, and he was sitting in the middle of the floor playing with some spoons and forks and whatever he had, utensils, kind of just playing, banging them around. And he jumped up out of the, off the floor, and he started, you ever see kids do that? I'm like... What in the world? Like, seriously. I've, I've had two children, biologically. What in the world was that? And so I grab the phone, and I'm bawling. Because, and excuse, excuse the word that I'm going to use, because at that time, I'm like, that is a retarded child. What is that? And I'm like, oh my God, I grabbed the phone. I called my husband at work and I'm trying to call him. He's always in his office, but he wasn't in his office and I was freaking out and I'm bawling because my child is displaying mental retardation things and there's something going on and, and answer your phone and oh my God. And he finally, he answered his phone and I'm just hysterical and and he's like, what's going on? He's thinking, you know, someone's dead and then, like, Abraham's, like, flapping his arms around the, you know, like, he, you know, he's doing this thing, like, you know, mental retarded kids, and I don't understand it, and I'm just like, can you don't listen to me, and you don't look at me, and I'm freaking out, because, like, there's something wrong with his brain, and I don't know what to do, you know, like, what do we do, and he's like, seriously, you called me for that? Like, he is two and a half years old, he is a bird, he's a bird, he's playing he's a bird I'm like oh my god what? I was so mad I was so upset what do I do my child is not a bird he's there's something mentally wrong with my child and we are not on the same page and I want a divorce I'm out of this marriage I'm so done with everything you know oh my god seriously and I can't even I can't even breathe at this moment and I grabbed the phone and I called the doctor's office and I said, look, there's something wrong with Abraham. I don't know what's wrong with him. It's been, you know, a while since we've seen him. You know, in the early stages, you go every two months and then they kind of stop and after they get all their shots. 
So I need to see him. I need to bring him in because he is doing some weird things, okay? And they're like, bring him in. So, okay, I put him in the car, put him and Jenna in the car, and we went to see Dr. Grant. And Dr. Grant, we got in, and it was awesome. He's seen him, and, and I'm like, he was doing like this, and he don't listen, and he was looking, you know, and I'm explaining all this stuff, and I'm still freaking out, you know. And he's like, calm down. And so he's just <laughs> taking notes. He's like, okay. And he's like, I'm talking to him, and I'm just saying, he ain't looking at you. He ain't looking at you, you know. And he's like, yeah, I see that. He goes, okay, so this is what's going on. He goes, I can't officially tell you this. So unofficially, because I can't diagnose this, but this is what's going on. <laughs> he says, your son is autistic. Um, he's on the spectrum somewhere. And I'm like, what? What do you mean the spectrum? Like, he goes, you need to be evaluated and looked at, you know, because I don't believe it's his hearing, but we're going to send him off for hearing tests. And so this was the beginning of autism in my, in my life. Two and a half years old, I was sent from Dr. Grant to AEA, and we went and had a hearing test, and they put him in this little booth, and the monkey made big loud noises, and he jumped. You know, he reacted to the scary monkey, but he's never looked at the scary monkey. You know, he just, you know, he was still, like, zoned out, but he would jump, so they, like, he's hearing perfectly. You know, if the monkey was over there doing it, he'd, he wouldn't look, but he would jump, and you know, every now and then he'd, he'd, his eyes would go up, you know, like, oh, because he knew where it was coming from. So they said his hearing's 100%. He's, he's, he's hearing, but he's autistic. So that was the second time I was told that he has, he's on the spectrum. I still did not understand the spectrum. I'm like, okay. I left there that day with a pamphlet that said autism. So what you need to know. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'm in the world of autism now. Now what are we going to do? And it was like, I had no help. Like, AEA was great. They could tell me he could hear, and, and, but here's your pamphlet. And, um, you know, we sort of kind of can tell you that he's diagnosed. But now, the only thing they said was you need to have him, like, documented, physically documented that he is autistic or on the spectrum. So you have to go to get him evaluated by a psychiatrist. It has to be a mental health neurological psychiatrist now. And I'm like, okay, now he's autistic. So I read this little book and it's about 10 pages long and it's really cute, got cute pictures of drawings and stuff of autism. <laughs> whatever that looks like. <laughs> they don't show all the bad things in there, you know, because this is your first day of autism. So, you know, it, this is what it is. It's a mental disorder. They don't have uh, any clues why it happens or who it happens to or why it happens to the ones that it's happening to. You know, they just don't tell you anything except for there is no cure. There's no cure. I said, oh, yeah? Well, I'm the mama that you just told me that I couldn't cure my son. Okay. I'm going to cure Abraham. That was my goal from that moment on. I was like, it's on. Now, <laughs> now it was a fight. I went home, and I got on the Internet, and I read everything I could. I researched till my brain felt like it was going to explode. I, I read studies and and people's comments and I just did anything and everything for like two months I just like threw myself into that world and tried to pick and choose what would fit me because nobody would tell you I mean everybody told you yeah this was the way this is what you got to do this is what you got to do to your child this is how you got to treat your child this is the medication you need but what I quickly realized was that our, my child was going to be a guinea pig because there's, there's no cure. So whatever I pick and choose, I have to be very wise about because I could ultimately hurt my child. 
because the stuff out there that people are saying, hey, this works for mine, and this worked for that, and, you know, maybe it won't work for mine, and maybe it will be worse than it was when, so it was really, really hard. I just had to, like, weigh and measure everything, and um, I did finally get him uh, diagnosed officially. He was just turning three. He was, he was just about that two and a two and three quarters, right before three. And um, the doctor from Iowa, University of Iowa, they looked at him. Oh, they watched him for about 10 minutes. They had him in a room, and they watched him on the monitor, the screen. And they said, yeah, and they had toys and everything. And he, of course, he's not playing with toys. So they're like, yep, he's autistic. OK. Like, OK. At that point, he was not medicated or anything because he was just, he was still like that toddler playing around, just wasn't listening, wasn't looking. But very quickly after he was diagnosed and I was thrown into that and trying to research, you know, what can I do for him? What, how can I fix him? How can I make him better? Um, I um, noticed that he started to get angry. He couldn't talk. He wasn't talking. He couldn't communicate. And usually about that time, kids, you know, the words that he did have, he had about five, you know, mom, mom, uh, drink, drink. And we were doing a little sign language with him too. And um, ball, he liked his ball. So he'd be like ball and he'd kick his ball. You know, there was like five words. But those words disappeared because with autism, a lot of times you'll have it'll come and it'll go regression. It comes and it goes. So what he's doing today, he might not be doing tomorrow. Or he can lose it for a long time. And he lost his, his voice for years. Um, he started uh, head banging. He started self-injuring. He looked like I beat him. It looked like I beat this child. And he was black and blue all the time. Bruises all over his legs, all over his arms, because on top of being so frustrated that he couldn't speak or, or tell us what he's always grabbing me, you know, grabbing me. And I know he wanted something, but I don't know what you want, you know. And he'd be like, ah, and then boom, hit his head on the wall, hit his head on the floor. He would look for the hardest surface to bang his head. And it was just, oh, you know, I'd throw myself under him. And he'd still end up banging himself. And it was just the hardest time. And... Um, AEA finally came in when he was three because they were like, you know, early intervention, you know, so let's, let's get him, you need help, you know, and the only thing we can do is we can play with him. So they started to play with him on the floor. They tried to get him to um, do hand over hand and, and do their little puzzles and do little things that they wanted to do well because they called that early intervention. And now in the beginning, I was like, Get your hands off my child. I was so mad because they were making him cry and scream. And, you know, they were desensitizing him to touch because he don't want to be touched. If you remember when he was in church, I still brought him to church. And that was a crazy time. The head banging, he'd take his clothes off. You know, he'd run around the church in his underwear, his little whiteies. And he was up and down the aisles. And everybody knew Abraham, so they just were like, she's a mom, just let her deal with it. It's okay. I know the visitors were like, what in the world? You know, this boy's running around in his underwear. But that was Abraham. He, he, wherever he felt comfortable at home, first time he throw his shoes off, his socks off, and his clothes off, and he's in his underwears, and he's running around the house. That was Abraham. He did that at church. He felt comfortable because his family loved him. His church family understood that I was having troubles, you know, and they never reprimanded him or me. So that was a blessing. Yes. So with Abraham and his self-injuring and with early intervention, um, we quickly uh, became medicated. They put him on Risperidol. And that, at that time, he couldn't swallow pills. So they had this liquid Risperidol. And I had to dose it up and hold him down and get it in his mouth, you know, because he'd spit it all over. And I'm like, you know how much this costs? You know, kid, you know, because not everything was covered at that time. 
Iowa did not recognize autism as a, it was a disorder that was not paid by Medicare or Medicaid. So we were paying out of pocket with Tyson Insurance too. And it was about a year after, when my, about the time he turned four. So we only paid for about a year of doctor visits and stuff like that. We got him into not only early intervention and the medication, but I got him into um, Spencer. They had a specialty clinic. They have it now, and they redid it. They started it all over. But for six years, two days, three days, four days a week, I drove for one hour therapies. Every day, like Mondays or, and Wednesdays and Fridays, I think we started off three days a week, we would go to speech therapy. We'd go to food therapy because he didn't eat the textures bothered him so he was like he'd eat hot dogs and at that time it was hot dogs and Lay's potato chips that's all he ate that's all he ate forever and I'm like how does my child live on a hot dog and potato chips I'm such a bad mom you know the mom guilt Ugh. it's really bad so yeah we uh we did all these therapies three days a week um, drive there for an hour, you know, it's, it's like 40 minute drive if you drive the speed limit, okay? Cheryl can do it in 25 when she's really in a hurry. But you know, legally, legally I shouldn't. And so I get to Spencer, I get into our appointment, which is an hour, and that's three hours of our lives. Three days a week. It was just like, I was exhausted. And um, you know, I was gonna fix him. That was the whole mindset, was Cheryl is gonna fix Abraham, and I'm gonna cure this boy, because they say there's no cure, but we're doing therapy, we're doing intervention, we've got medication, um, and so I changed his diet. He didn't have a diet, but anything that was not good that he wanted to have, like I, I read about, he loved milk, okay, he loved milk. He would drink a gallon of milk. I mean, we'd go through a gallon of milk in a day and a half, if that, maybe even a day. Sometimes we went through a lot of milk. And I was like, why does he drink so much milk? And that's all he wanted in his cup was milk. And one of the research papers that I had read and studied was the protein in milk it causes uh, you, uh, what is that? You know, euthoric, what was that word? Yep, like an opiate, like an opiate effect on the brain of kids with autism, OCD, ADHD. And I'm like, what? And it, and it causes their brain to almost become numb to pain. It's the casein in milk.